thank you all for making it up. I uh, hope you enjoyed your breakfast burritos and your coffee. So I'm going to be talking today about things that surprised me when I was a new developer. And I am a developer advocate at Transposit, or actually I will be on Monday. I'm starting a new job. But this talk is not about Transposit. Transposit is a platform that combines Heroku and Zapier-like functionality. So it's a way for you to build applications that compose APIs pretty easily. But this talk came out of a blog that I maintained called letters2developer.com. And basically that was a, a site where I basically wrote down uh, information that was interesting to me now and I think would have helped me when I was starting out my career. So this talk is really about what surprised me. So this is about what I knew or I thought I knew when I was starting out and what actually over my 20 years of career has turned out to be false. So um, I hope that this will help you have some perspective and it also will short circuit some of the learning that I had to do. It was kind of painful in some ways. So unfortunately, I'm sorry, it's not about getting hired as a new developer. I don't know any secrets to that or any surprises to that. And it's also been a little while since I've been in the market as a new developer, and I've heard things have changed a little bit in the last 20 years, just a, a, a couple of things. It is always important to know the context of anybody giving you advice, and so I want to give you a little bit of information about me. Let's talk about me a little bit. Uh, I have been a developer for about 20 years, engineering manager, tech lead, tech instructor, uh, co-founder of a startup, CTO of that same startup. I have mostly been in the Denver metro area and mostly done web development, although some database uh, data integration stuff. I have been about, spent about half my career uh, as a W2 employee and then about uh, the other half as a contractor. And um, the companies I've worked for have been in, in range of size from like two employees to 100,000. So, the 100,000 was a company that ran for the Schmoracle, so that's a name. <laughs> uh, and that was as a contractor. I don't know that I would, it, it would be an interesting place to be an employee. So anyway, the whole point of that spiel is not to puff myself up, it's to say if you're looking for a job at Google, or if you want to like move to New York City and work in the finance sector, you should probably ignore a lot of what I have to say, because it's not going to be necessarily applicable. So I'd like to know, know a little bit more about who you are. So can you raise your hand if you're a developer? All right. Can you raise your hand if you manage developers? All right. Who, uh, if you're not a developer, are you a designer? I'm kind of curious, the people that are, the people that didn't raise their hands when they're a developer, are you product people or designers or in school or in school? <laughs> awesome. Well, then I can, you're still a developer if you're in school, 100%. Okay, uh, and then the other question I had is, who here is less than two years of professional experience? Great, great. So everyone who has more, feel free to take pot shots at me, but uh, people who have less, you're definitely my target audience, and you're definitely people that I want to help, and uh, I also would say that I want to hear questions from you, right? So I'm going to talk through a couple of scenarios, talk through some advice, but if you have any questions or comments about that, or if I say something that's not clear, please just raise your hand and let me know. I'd rather have this be a discussion than have it be me talking at you for 25 to 40 minutes. Uh, I may take a little bit of time to complete a thought, but you know, keep, keep your hand up and I'll definitely uh, take questions. So let's move on to the surprises. The first surprise that I learned was the power of saying no. And so what I thought was that you need to say yes all the time at your job when I started out. And that was because a lot of people liked me. It was because I wanted to uh, not hurt my career. And I also thought it was going to lead to more opportunities. And it does some of that. But what I learned is that it actually is Oh, if you say no, it's a way to protect your time and yourself. And if you don't, you're head down a, a, a wrong path. And so one of the, the times when I learned this is, and this tells you how old I am, we, I worked for a company that wanted to make, it was a consulting company, 
it was, I think at that time, about 100-ish people in Boulder. And we had a client who wanted to make a clone of Yahoo. And they were going to put ads on it and make a billion dollars. And it was a small team. We were working with an interesting technology. Interesting-ish technology. And the lead developer, it was me and another developer and a product manager. The lead developer felt sick. And so it was on me to help get this project over the finish line. And I, they asked me, and I said yes, and I took this on. And I ended up working a lot of hours. And the one that sticks with me is there was a week where I worked 96 hours in a week. Now, there are only 160 hours in a week total, right? So I was working more than half that, including sleeping time. You can imagine that wasn't super fun for me, uh, not very fun for, uh, I wasn't, I was, had roommates at the time, but they didn't see very much of me, so maybe it was fun for them, I don't know. Uh, but I remember we, we completed the project, we launched, and they had a company meeting, and they brought me in, and then you know, brought me up and gave me a little gesture of appreciation, and now it's the quiz time. So I'm gonna give you three choices, and you tell me what you think they gave you. So, did they give me a thousand dollars bonus in my paycheck? That's choice A. Did they give me a nice gift card to a restaurant where I could take, you know, a couple friends out for dinner, or did they give me a six pack of beer and a T-shirt? So, uh, what? what? Six pack of beer and a T-shirt. Okay, six pack of beer and a T-shirt. So, everyone who said six pack of beer and a T-shirt, you get a six pack of beer and a T-shirt. Come and talk to me afterwards. No, I actually don't have that many six packs of beer. And a uh, yeah. So that to me was really eye opening. It's not that I expected a lot, but I thought that they would recognize the sacrifice I made and, and you know, uh, not just recognize it in a public way, but indicate the value of it. And that, I just learned that they didn't. And I was a salaried employee, and that's something I've took along with me to every other job, is that companies don't value your time the same way that you value your time. And the other thing I learned out of this experience was two or three, two or three years later, the website went under. And so I slaved away trying to meet that deadline, and I'll never get those hours of my life back, and uh, the website's gone. In fact, I checked it out just the other day, and you can actually buy the domain now. So I could get someone to buy the domain, <laughs> put my face on it. <laughs> so, another situation when this came up, the power of saying no, was more recently I worked at a consulting company. Excuse <coughs> me. Worked at a consulting company, and there were two projects happening. Uh, does anyone know what a consulting company is? Actually, I should just make sure. That, does anyone not know? Can you just clarify? Like, yeah, for sure. Like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's there. In my experience, there's two kinds of software <laughs> companies. Mainly, there are product companies that work on one product, like uh, his company, Orthify. Orthify, yes. Uh, where you're focusing on a segment, you sell something. Microsoft is another product company. Then there are consulting companies that basically sell hours. And so they sell expertise, and people can come to them with problems, and uh, they'll work on like a project basis. Is that clarify? Cool. So I work for a consulting company, and oh, that's actually something I should have said. I spend about half my time at product companies and half my time at consulting companies. So uh, they both have strengths and weaknesses in terms of what you do as a developer. And I can talk about that later in the question section if you want. But uh, let's go back to the, the, the priority slide. I was working at a consulting company, and I uh, was on a couple different projects. I was a senior member of the team, and so they, there were a couple projects that needed me, and no one else in the company could do what I could do at that time. And both the project managers came to me, or virtually came to me on Slack, and said, hey, you know, can you spend time to fix this issue? And if I had kept the same mindset that I'd had earlier in my career, I would have said yes and worked extra hard. And instead, I just said, hey, person A wants this for me, person B wants this for me. I don't have the time to do both of these today. They're both urgent issues. Can we get my priorities sorted out? And I ended up escalating to the CEO. It was a 15 person consulting company, so that's not that big a deal to escalate to the CEO. And we sorted out which could happen first. And that, I think, is a much 
better way to protect your time than to say yes and then kill yourself. Because there will always be another urgent issue. So how can you learn to say no? How can you empower yourself to say no? Well, the first thing I would do is save some money. Because even though it doesn't necessarily impact your career, especially if you're in a good place, saying, no, I can't slave away this weekend. Right? If you're in a place where they expect you to slave away every weekend, please look for a different place to work. But knowing that you have three to six months of income saved up so that you can quit the job and not have to take the first other job that comes along is going to give you a lot more power to say, no, I can't do that. The second thing I would say is learn how to say no. And the right way to say no in my mind is actually say yes, but then you follow it with but or and. Yes, <laughs> yes, I would love to help you with this, and I'm working on this other project right now. Or yes, I will do that, but that means that this other thing is going to slip. So, you know, you want to practice that, and the next, very next thing you should say is, what's my priority? Especially as a new developer, you might not know the big picture, right? You might not know that you're working on task A right now, but task B is more important because it keeps task C, D, and E from actually getting done. And you should ask the person who's retasking you, hey, what should I be working on? Right? I was working on task A. Is it more important to work, that I work on task B? Finally, and this is illustrative by my, uh, of my experience in the consulting company, the recent experience, know who you're supposed to ask. You should know who is tasking you. And that can be an explicit person, right? Somebody that you can go and just ask questions of, your manager. Or it could be a child owner, and you just need to know where that is. If you don't, if you were in a company where you don't know what tasks you should be doing next, then that's that's problematic. So a few caveats. The very next question, after you say yes, I am working on A, but should I be working on B? The very next question that people will ask you, I guarantee you, the project managers will ask, or your manager will ask, is, well, how long do you think A is going to take? How long do you think B is going to take? Right? Because they, that's how they can make a decision. Because if A is only going to take 15 minutes more, maybe B can wait. So practice your estimation. That could be a whole separate talk, actually. But I just want you to be aware that you're going to be asked to estimate how long things take. I think it's also important that you emphasize you're all on the same team and you're all trying to solve the same problems. And that turns it from being a no that's kind of a curmudgeonly thing into a no, I am protecting my time, but I'm happy to like help solve this problem for us. And then finally, I'd say learn your boundaries. And I will say, at other jobs, I have worked, never worked 96 hours again, but I have worked 50 or 60 hour weeks because of the position I was in, the position the project was in, and my own estimation of the importance of it. But I walked into that. I knew that choice. I didn't expect any thank you from the company. I walked in there. I accepted that choice. Any questions about power saying no? Can everyone say no really loudly once? No. no. All right. <laughs> that wasn't that was to say no. Yeah. It was like responding no. I'll, you were saying I'll, no. You're not going to say no. Uh, there's always one in every talk. Uh, the next surprise for me was someday you're not going to want to code. So what I thought was that being a developer was pretty awesome. You're paid to learn. You are working with what tend to be pretty smart, interesting people. You are paid well. And flow. How many people have experienced flow when they've been coding? Like, it's, it's amazing. Time flies by. You see what you build. People are thankful for it. Uh, lots of times, I've been in situations where i built things that have saved people so much time, like non-technical people. And that's just such a rush for me. So I thought, first couple of years of my career, why on earth would anybody ever want to leave this type of position? And what I learned is there are actually other great jobs out there that are related to software, and there are reasons why you might want to shift. So the little story is that I had a manager at that same company where I worked 96 hours, and I remember walking into his office one day, he was finishing up some typing, he was running off to a meeting, and he had been an early employee. I said, Brian, I think I was asking about vacation or something. I said, Brian, why are you not coding? You obviously like to code. Why are you not coding anymore? 
he was an entry manager. He took care of hiring and firing and vacation requests and stuff like that. He said, he smiled at me and he said, Dan, somebody will understand. <laughs> and lo and behold, 10 years later, I did understand. I was working at a real estate brokerage, managing a small team, and I just hired a new person uh, named Karam Jeet. And he was right out of his internship. And he, uh, does everyone know what an MLS is? Cool, so it's a real estate brokerage. MLS is basically a source of listing data for homes. And in this company, we built a website. It was a primary business driver that showed a bunch of homes across Colorado. And every so often, MLSs, not every so often, sorry. MLSs are regionally based. So there's a Denver MLS, there's a Colorado Springs MLS, and they're not compatible in any real way. But we were pulling all that data into our website so that users could find homes from wherever on the farm range they wanted to. It was a complicated process. There were like 100 fields to map. There were issues with the way that you got photos, which are really, really important in the real estate business. There were uh, rules around what you could show and could not show. And so we spent some time making this process simpler. And I remember the moment that Karam Jeet, who was a relatively new developer, was able to bring new MLS online. And it was really an uh, exciting moment for him, but it was also exciting for me because one, I saw the growth that he had uh, attained, where he learned how to do this complicated thing that had taken, previously taken senior engineers a number of months. And two, it was great for me because I was able to go and work on helping other parts of the business out or doing some longer term strategic thinking. So that was one of the times in my career that stands out to me is when I learned that not being hands on coder is actually a valuable thing. So let's talk about a little bit why it's valuable. One, it increases your impact. And by impact, I mean the things that you can change at, uh, in the outside world. Two, it increases your influence across a company. You can have influence as an individual contributor, as a developer, absolutely. But I found that, the <laughs> ironically, the further away you get from the code, the more influence you have. And I'm not sure whether it's a causation or correlation. Because of those previous two factors, impact and leverage, you tend to get more money. I don't think I've ever been in an organization where the individual contributors made more than the managers or people that were affiliated with software but not necessarily hands-on coders. There probably are organizations like that. I know that some of the Silicon Valley companies pay developers really well, but because of the leverage and the impact that people who move into some of these other roles have, they can afford to pay them more. Finally, I think that there's a little bit of a tech treadmill that it can be nice to step off of a little bit. And as someone who's been around for 20 years, I see a little bit of reinvention of the wheel. An example of that actually is TypeScript, which is apparently the new hotness. I'm not really a, I'm a back-end person, but I work with Google Web Toolkit. Does anyone know what Google Web Toolkit is? Nice, okay. It basically, you wrote Java and it transpiled into JavaScript. So you have type language, strongly typed, you do awesome refactoring. I am not a TypeScript expert, but it feels to me like that's a lot, a very similar kind of thing. So you start to see these cycles, and that it's kind of fun to chase new technology, or it was fun for me when I was a new developer. After you see the same technology appear, or the problems and the solutions appear multiple times, you get a little jaded. And so some of these roles let you step off that treadmill a little bit, more or less depending on what you do. So real quick, some of the other roles, Project leader or team lead is another one. Is it kind of the first one that a lot of developers take that step off of? Off, actually, that kind of uh, a lot of developers move to. And here you'll be working with project managers. You'll be responsible for a project, and uh, you are, in my experience, responsible for making sure that other members of the team are not blocked. And so you do things like set up dev environments make sure CICD is working, and take lots of client, or some client calls. Engineering manager is another step up. There you're concerned with hiring and firing, and vacation. Firing is not very fun, by the way. Um, newsflash, it's not fun for anybody. Uh, but 
you know, there you can actually take a little bit further of a step off the tech general. When you're a project lead, you're probably still going to be involved in coding some. Engineering managers, depending on the size of your company, you might not be coding at all. You might be, and actually I would advocate that as an engineering manager, you should be coding very much, right? If you, you can scratch that edge occasionally. I don't know, do you code? You're, you said you were a manager. Yes. How big is your team? Uh, right now about like five people. Right. Do you code on anything that's crucial to that? Um, only if there's people on vacation. Right. For the most part. Yeah, right. like I don't have a filler pretty much. Right. And that's that's the I mean that's the side that's the change you're gonna have to make, right? That's where you, you don't get the flow except for on maybe side projects or occasionally because you're busy being ping ponged by people. In a good way, right? I mean that's your job as a manager is to unblock people. It's a different kind of skill set. Uh, technology instructor is another option. I did that for a year and a half, and there you definitely won't be getting out the tech treadmill. You'll need to stay on the treadmill, but you'll be super focused and you won't be doing implementation pieces. And finally, developer advocate, which is kind of the intersection of marketing and, and being a developer. And I'm just starting that job, so I can't speak, uh, uh, speak to it very well. But there's a lot more options out there. I cut this down. So any questions about the, um, yeah, sorry. Any questions? I don't want to distract you. Eyes on me. Any questions about uh, somebody you want to cover? Does everyone believe that somebody want to code or you think I'm bullshit? You believe me? I believe you. Okay. <laughs> so one person said, okay, <laughs> my job is done. I'm done. I can drop the mic. Um, I have a related yeah, of course. How often do you see developers move into products, if ever? So yeah, most of my companies have been so small that, actually, no, I can, I can think, I know at least one of the, my former colleagues would definitely move into products. So, I think you can do that for sure. Uh, you have you seen that as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it also depends on what the product is, right? Because I think that like you, like if you're working for a developer centric company like a Stripe or something like that, then the transition is a little bit easier than if you're working for orth uh, orthodox company, right? Where you want to have that domain knowledge. But I think product is actually one of the ones I come off from here when I show this in my life, and she's like, that's too many bullet points on the slide. Uh, because I think product, you actually have a lot of strengths coming in as a developer because you know the how, and product is all about the why, but sometimes the how constrains the why, or it can inform the why. Yeah. Um, do you have any advice for setting yourself up for this transition into different roles? Yeah, I think that any role in particular? No, just just in general. Yeah, so I mean, I think project leader and engineering manager, project lead or team lead is kind of a natural thing, right? Like that happens once you've been around a, a, a place for long enough. Uh, engineering manager, I think there you need to look at a company that's big enough uh, to support it because I've worked at, I mean, that company where I worked with three developers at real estate brokerage. I was basically kind of stuck at the team lead role until the, the CTO left because there just weren't that many places. So if you really want to be an engineering manager, then you want to look at a company that's growing or that is, is big. Uh, the other thing about that is that I think as an engineering manager, there's two paths. There's the, I'm going to keep climbing up the ladder. And then there's also the, I want to be an engineering manager for a while, then I want to go back to being a technology person. And you can kind of swing back and forth. And that's what I've done personally. I don't, when you get to a certain point of engineering management, what I've seen is that you're just in meetings all day, there's political BS, there's like battles for like empire building, and that just, that stuff doesn't interest me. That's why I tend to work for smaller companies. Uh, tech instructor, you know, I think there it's just get really deep and pursue technology. Does that help yeah, you? No, that's perfect. Thank cool. You. Any other questions? Cool. Let's go on to uh, John Travolta. So the other, the big spice for me was that your network matters almost as much as, or in some cases more than merit does in terms of finding jobs or getting new jobs. So what I thought was that companies hire the best. And as soon as you become a hiring manager or you get inside a company and you go to interviews, you realize that that's an ideal that is constrained by time, effort, uh, I didn't start my timer over there. I'm doing great time. 
<laughs> so it's uh, time, effort, money, obviously. And there's a couple other dimensions that are interesting to me. There's the dimension of locatability, which is can you be thought of? Are you are the people who are hiring you aware that you even exist? Right? You might be the best person for job X, but if no one knows who you are, then they're not going to be able to talk to you and hire you. And then the other one is credibility. And so this is, do the people in the hiring world know that you can do the job? Notice I did not say, can you do the job? Right? There's a subtle difference. And so you need to make sure that they know you can do the job. And that's a, uh, both of those, sorry, both those dimensions, both locatability and credibility, can actually be helped by personal connection. So what's personal connection? Some of you've worked with, some of you've met at a conference, uh, some of you've met at a meetup. I will say those aren't the only ways to get those two dimensions taken care of. I think writing a blog, I've blogged for 13 years. I think blogging is the bee's knees. Who here has, has blogged? Who here has blogged for more than a year? Who has blogged for more than five years? 10, 15. How many years do you blog for? Uh, about, uh, I, well, I got, got in on live, live journal on, uh, on, the, on the early days, so nice. it's, it's, still, <laughs> it's still up there. Do you still use your live journal? No, I, I, I moved on to my, own, to my own domain. Sure. Cool. Yeah, I mean, so blogging or an open source project is another great way to do that where you can gain credibility and like locatability without knowing the people. I mean, I guess you kind of learn to know people, but personal connection is just so much easier and it's so much more natural for the first part of your career. So a story about that is that at that same consulting company, I was sitting next to a guy named Ron, who's a database contractor, and we were working on some project. And in walks Mark. And Mark says, hey, Ron, how you doing? And Ron says, hey, I didn't know you were hired. And they, it turns out they have worked together 15 years before. And so that just indicates to me like the circle of uh, continuity and how often you end up working with people that you've worked with before. And so that obviously has a couple of ramifications. You know, don't burn your bridges, keep in touch with people. But it also, uh, to, you know, part of it was, sorry, some of this happened to me too. The, actually, the last job I got before this new job I'm starting on Monday, I got it from people that I worked with 20 years ago. And I just kept, kept in touch with them. When they came in town, I had coffee with them, uh, sent them occasional emails saying, hey, how's the business going? And it turned out that I had a availability and they had a job opening that fit me. So I think that it's important to realize that these um, connections you make in school and in uh, your first couple of jobs can stay with you for decades, especially in the Boulder Denver area. I feel like that's a smaller community than the Bay Area. And just anecdotal evidence, my, uh, I looked back for this presentation, four of my five full-time jobs and seven out of my 10 major contracts that I've gotten were people that knew me before I got the job. And then anecdotally, I think 82%, somebody did a LinkedIn survey and found that 80% of people found jobs via network. Now, that was not a statistically significant survey, but I think it's indicative. So how can you maintain these connections? Well, I think the first thing you need to do is not party on. The first thing you need to do is to be excellent. So do really good work especially the first couple of months of your uh, job, and people will remember that. It's actually kind of surprising how low the bar is, I think, for doing excellent work. Uh, it's show up on time, it's do what you say you're gonna do, and tell people that you're gonna do, I'm sorry, it's say what you're gonna do and then actually do it, right? And you'd be astonished how many people either don't say what they're gonna do and so no one knows what they're doing, or they say they're gonna do something and then they don't do it. Then also ask questions, and then uh, the final one is don't make the same mistake twice. Everyone's allowed to make mistakes, just don't do the same. <laughs> don't make the same mistake twice. Uh, and I think that will put you, in my experience, that puts you about 90, 90th percentile of developers, which is kind of sad, but Humans. what's that? Humans. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, that is a, <laughs> a good point. 
Um, the manager in the room, is that 10 year experience? Is that, would you say 70 or 80? Or, yeah. Yeah, maybe 90. Yeah. Once you've done that, and I guess I would say the reason why I started with that is if you don't do that, then you won't really have credibility, right? So to maintain credibility, once you've done the excellent work, you want to make sure you connect to people, and then you want to make sure you inform them about what you're doing. So as far as connection, I already talked about how it's best to talk to people that you have worked with, or if you haven't had the chance to work yet, school or meetups, and then use the power of the internet connect on LinkedIn or Twitter, and then you want to make sure you inform these people because you're telling them what they, you're helping them know what you know how to do. And when you learn a new skill, they probably aren't going to know that, right, because they're busy with their own lives. So you can do that implicitly by posting on these social networks about what you're doing. You can also do it more explicitly by meeting people for coffee. And there you want to talk about what you're doing. I also found it to be very useful to just to see interesting articles. I'm always on Reddit or Hacker News, and whenever I see something that's, that's applicable to what I'm doing and is of interest to somebody else, I send it to them because you don't know how you're going to help them. Locatability is a little bit different. It's, it's roughly the same thing, but instead of connecting people and telling them what you're doing, it's helping them. So how can you help them? Well. In that coffee meeting, you should definitely be saying, hey, what can I do for you? And you have no idea what they might be looking for that you might be able to help them with. Right? They might be looking for clients or employees or uh, reference documentation of something or a connection into a company. You just don't know. And so ask. And then I think it's very easy to do favors on social networks like LinkedIn or Twitter. I always pass on job requirements when friends say, hey, we're looking to hire somebody. Uh, occasionally, I pass on clients. Again, I need to send interesting articles, and that's much more about their interests than it is about that, your interests. I talked to a .NET person uh, yesterday that I met at Develop Denver, and next, if I, I didn't get his contact information, but if I had, the next .NET article I would have run across, I would have sent to him. And I would say, hey, you know, it seems like this might be an interest to you. How many of you have ever liked a, a job post that someone posts on LinkedIn? I have, have you, has, has anyone ever actually had someone get a job through that? Nice. So, what's your, what's your story? Uh, I got a job through a Oh, cool. Cool. So, so, I did the same thing where I saw an acquaintance who posted a job, I clicked like on it, it took me about three seconds, and a former colleague looked at that, said, oh, I can, I can be an SEO specialist, and got and got the job. And they worked together for a couple of years. And it took me zero time. So at the very least, I think if you go on LinkedIn and you just click like on the jobs that people that you know are posting, it's going to be helpful to other people. That's a super easy, low, and, and by the way, people remember when you help them get a job. <laughs> people remember that quite a bit. And people who hire remember who helped them hire, too. So that's about it. I just want to say thank you to you, my audience, coming at the crack of crack nine o'clock. Uh, also to the sponsors of Develop Denver. I know that they are key to putting this on, and then also the whole volunteers. Uh, they are also clutch for this. So thank you all. Uh, say no. Can you never say no again. No. That was awesome. Uh, look, think about looking past coding for your career. Pay attention to people and keep in touch with them. There's so many more tips that I have that aren't really surprising, but just interesting tips. And I am looking for guest bloggers for my site. I post twice a week, 200 to 1,500 word essays. And I've had people with 20 years of experience posts, and I've had people with two months of experience post. So always interesting. Uh, yes? If you enjoy writing, what would be the best way to start a blog post? Like if you had a, like a website that you built as your portfolio, would you start a blog on there if you're a developer, or would you be separate from that? Um, so you're saying, so the question is, if you like writing, how would I start blogging is basically yes. the question. I think that the best way to start blogging is to go to wordpress.com and sign up for a free WordPress blog because I think as developers, it can be very easy to get wrapped up in the 
how am I going to deploy this? And mm -hmm. should I use a static website tool or should I use WordPress? And what if I have to maintain it? You don't want that stuff to get in the way of actually doing the writing because the writing is hard enough on its own. So go to WordPress, sign up. And then the other thing I would say is that I probably got, if I'm generous, one, two hits a day on my new developer blog for the first three months. And you just gotta like be willing to like write for yourself and like realize that you're not gonna suddenly be famous. And not that I'm, not that I'm famous right now, but you know, that the writing has benefits for other people, they find it, but has benefits for you in terms of clarifying your thoughts and being a credibility piece you can point people to, right? I've actually been in job interviews where they've uh, creeped my blog and they've said, oh, so you're interested in, or you've done this. And it is a, it's way easier to say, oh, you guys use Elasticsearch? I wrote this about Elasticsearch two years ago than to say, oh, I can learn Elasticsearch. Right? So, does that help you answer your question? Yes, and have you ever used Medium for blogging at all? I, so I've cross-posted a couple things to Medium, and I think, I guess I should re rephrase my answer. Uh, WordPress.com is the easiest thing for me. I think Medium, you should do the easiest thing that would possibly work, and if Medium's easier for you, I always worry about like, I, I'm the kind of dude who ran his own email service for a number of years, right? I, I worry about like, control of my content, and I don't know what Medium's export capabilities are, so that'd be my only worry. I know Medium is good because it kind of can bring you more audience. One thing I would look at if you're like, oh, I really want the audience for Medium, is I'd probably do my own blog and then cross post to Medium. And the same with uh, Dev.2, which is like a developer site, uh, you can cross post there, so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, when you first started blogging, how did you market yourself to uh, get people to, to read your blog? So just through like social media for the most part, or just like grassroots kind of style? Yeah, so in 2003, I technorop, like there were, there were websites about that, and I commented on other people's <coughs> blogs. Um, Google is, is a huge source of traffic, obviously, over time. The, 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 the craziest thing about my blog is that the uh, the articles I think are like the least valuable are the ones that get most hits, like or that are super niche. And this is a piece of advice that people will tell you is to niche down as a as a consultant. And I totally understand that advice. I've always been too petrified to actually do it because I like to be a generalist. I, I've niched down some, but anyway, point is my blog is like sprawling. Like I've written about Yahoo Mail. I've written about uh, dating apps. That I not not dating apps like Bumble or something like that, like dating apps I've installed. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'm rambling like. Oh, yeah, I'm just more curious, like if someone wanted to start a blog, like any like advice in regards to like, you know, after writing it, like how to get traffic. Sure. So, so nowadays I would post to uh, Hacker News and Lobster and Reddit, and I would not post as a newbie, I would like <laughs> build a, a piece of content. I would build a profile on those sites, like I add some comments, I post other people's things, and that's what I do. I don't use Reddit so much, but probably, I probably post 10 times a month Hacker News like submissions, and maybe one or two of those is mine. And that's actually, by the way, that reminds me, that's actually a really fun thing to do, and I've had this happen a couple times, where I'll know somebody who's written an interesting article about software, or there was one about composting, there was one about uh, polar bears, I think, and I'll post that on Hacker News. There was one about giving first, and I'll post it on Hacker News, and it goes to the top of Hacker News, and this person's like, oh my god, who posted that? And then they read, they found out it was you, and again, that's a long play, but it's super fun to like help someone else get that kind of uh, visibility. So I would not just post my own blog posts every time. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. So if, uh, what you said about uh, looking towards engineering management, uh, if you're someone who sees a lot of the positives, like helping to develop people, having big impact on projects, mm -hmm. and all that sounds great, and that's things that you're, you're kind of looking towards, but you think about things like firing people, you think about like having a really tough conversation, and that just terrifies you to your core. Is that a sign that you need to work on your software, or is that just saying that's not cut out for you, like that's not gonna work if you can't take the good with the bad? I mean, I think you have to explain. Right? I mean, I don't think, I don't think firing, um, except for maybe that up in the air guy, uh, that movie. 
I don't think flattering is ever easy for anybody. So, uh, and you know, you want to, there are lots of times, and I haven't experienced this personally, but I've read about it, heard about it, where firing was actually a good thing for the employee because they weren't a fit, right? And so they went off and found something else that was better for them. And they, somebody was talking about, they got, a, I was, oh, who was I was talking to? Somebody said they actually got a thank you note. No, it was actually my, my new CEO actually got a thank you note from somebody that he fired because they were like, yeah, it was the wrong spot for me and I need to like, I needed to find a new place. So don't be afraid of that. I would say I've taken a couple swings in injury management. I am to the point now, is this going to be recorded forever? <laughs> no, no. I'm not sure that injury management is for me anymore because I've taken a couple swings at it, but I think you got to try to take that swing. So I would definitely, you know, go for that project lead. I don't know whether you're there now, but uh, and then just see whether you can take the next step. So does that answer your question? Or? I think so. Yeah, I guess the, the, I guess my short answer would be, you, it's always going to be uncomfortable to fire people. So you don't know whether it's going to be a deal breaker for you, whether it's an uncomfortable point of like, oh my god, I want to quit my job, or it's just like something I can't get over. Cool. Any other questions? Yes. Um, do you have Twitter, and how important do you feel like that is as a developer to have Twitter? Because I'm like super anti-social media, but I have LinkedIn, so I don't know. Like, a lot of people recommend Twitter. So. Sure. So I do have Twitter. Um, oh, right there. No worries. Uh, I'm I'm inter I'm an intermittent user because I find it to be a sinkhole of my time, right? Like uh, it's and so I guess the question for any of these tools, just like the internet Slack can be a sinkhole, just like. A blog is less of a sinkhole, I think, because you end up with a, a work product out of it. So I guess my question is always, what do you want to achieve? If you want to get access to people, like I actually, I help run a meetup, and I can actually access people on Twitter that I couldn't get email addresses mm -hmm. for. Right? I can just tweet at them and say, hey, do you want to present at our meetup? Uh, but for general, like, certainly as a hiring manager, I've never looked at someone's Twitter feed. I, much, I always look at their LinkedIn feed, and I, if they have like a GitHub, I'll take a brief look at that. Uh, that's not something that I ding them on. And then um, if they have a blog or something like that or some side project, I think those are more important than Twitter. Yeah. Especially for a new developer, I would not. I mean, but counterpoint, I know people that have gotten jobs from Twitter, right? So if you're willing to engage, that's actually one of the things I should have said about blogging and any of these networks is you just have to commit. You have to commit six months to them and really put in the time. You can't put up one. How many of you have run across blogs that have like two blog posts from <laughs> four five years ago, right? Like that just is kind of sad. And it doesn't mean that you take it down because the blog posts might have value, but you just got to commit. It's, it's hard to, but that's the biggest thing for any of these. Yeah? Uh, so you have done freelance work? How do you compare that versus like, agency work and the pros and cons of the two? What did you prefer? So, so the question is, do, did I prefer freelance, like kind of single person contracting work versus agency work yeah. as a consulting company? Yeah. I mean, uh, at different times in my life, they were both great, right? I think that the benefits of freelancing are just the total control that you have and the ability to fire clients easily. That's a big win. Um, it can be kind of lonely, and it can be super scary. So as soon as I got married and had a family, I got much less interested in contracting, although I've done some since then. Um, agency work can be great. It can be a little bit of pressure cooker. The nice thing about that is that someone else is doing sales and marketing. So you get to like do more focus on development. Does that give you a flavor? Yeah. Okay. Do it this. We are at time. Okay, so cool. Well, I'm happy to go to the back and chat with anybody else. You, you said you had a question real quick. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it.